What can we learn from 30 years of African National Congress rule in Gauteng? We speak to veteran Democratic Alliance politician Jack Bloom. Welcome, Mr. Bloom. Uh, good to be with you. May we go back to the beginning, how it all started and progressed through the various premiers. Please give us a quick rundown of those African National Congress premiers. Well, it was very interesting in, in 94, where we started off with a provincial unity government. That's interesting. It's not a, a new thing. But of course, the ANC had a solid majority then, and they don't have a majority now. So that's one thing that's, that's actually changed after 30 years. But uh, we started off with uh, Toke Sokwale. You know, he was he was youngish and handsome and charismatic and popular, actually. And you'd think that he would have been uh, a long-term premier, would have done great things, but he actually only lasted just over three years. And I think part of the problem was that uh, at one stage, uh, you know, he used the phrase in office but not in power, so he seemed to be a bit uh, frustrated by by, by uh, trying to get the bureaucracy to work. But the real problem is that his uh, provincial cabinet was chosen not by him, which is the constitutional position, was chosen by the ANC provincial executive. And that's all the, the problem from start to finish. You don't get the best people. You get all the, all the factions that have to be accommodated. So, in fact, he had some uh, not so good people in his cabinet. They caused a lot of trouble. But ultimately, you know, business beckoned, offers were made to him. And he left and became a very rich man. He was followed then by a premier that nobody remembers was Premier Matoli Machefa, uh, who was selected by the branches. And and you know, hopefully he was really hopeless and had, and and had a lot of op internal opposition. Uh, we as the DP then Democratic Party, we only had five seats, but uh, we used to come to our office. We used to have uh, leaked documents uh, under our doors. At, uh, at the Gauteng legislature, it's really rather amusing. And so there was a faction within the ANC that wanted to get rid of him. And that was when uh, Tab Mbeki uh, changed the rules so that he could appoint the premiers, essentially, if they weren't elected by the branches. So that was the end of Matoli Macheca. There was a lot of ANC infighting, as there is now. It seems to be a perennial problem. And Mbazima Shaloa came in. And I think he was probably the most substantive and, and solid of the ANC premiers. He nearly finished two terms. Uh, it's very significant. Not a single ANC premier from 94 to date has ever finished a full two terms. And if you look at the West of Cape, well, Helen Zilla did that. And it looks like uh, Alan Windy will as well. So there's been quite a lot of turbulence. I, I think uh, that Shaloa, I think he had presence. He, he seemed to unify the ANC. I think there were still a lot of corruption going on under there. Uh, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, it, it's an extraordinary thing in South African politics. He actually resigned in principle because uh, he couldn't abide Jacob Zuma. And it was just uh, about six months before the end of his term that um, he he resigned to form COPE. Uh, and that's when Paul Mashatile stepped in. Paul Mashatile was a completely unmemorable uh, premier for about six months. And of course, so that's uh, when the Alex Mafia came to the fore. And, uh, you know, I, I kept whole dossiers on all these fishy firms that were getting money. It was done through the Public Works and Transport Committee. And all his old buddies are still back there. It's just uh, extraordinary. So here was a man who was, uh, you know, a non-entity as a six-month premier. And now he's uh, the vice president of the country. Uh, but uh, reportedly the ANC got rid of him because, uh, you know, the corruption was too much, which says something even for them. And Nomvula Mokanyani came in and she was supposedly going to, to clean up all this corruption. So she did make big changes. She started off with a bang. You know, they all start off with a bang. They're all going to renew. And, and the way they speak when they start off, you'd think that they're coming out of the most terrible era and that they've got to change all sorts of things when it's the same political party. Uh, you know, I remember saying to Novula Mokanyani, when if, uh, you were a member of this previous administration, now you think it's so bad and you're going to clean it up. Uh, so she started off with a bang. And, uh, you know, I think, unfortunately, what happens is you, you get rid of one set of corrupt actors and you get uh, another set of corrupt actors. And uh, uh, Novula Mokanyani, interestingly, only had one term and a uh, term of office, five years. At least she completed it. And then David McCurra came in, and he was also supposed to be a new face. So we had 
uh, Nomvula Mokanyani coming in with renewal. Uh, then after her five years of so-called renewal, we had Dave Makura coming in. And I remember commenting at the time, I think he used the word radical about 20 times. Everything was going to be radical this and radical that. And by the time we came to his last year in office, he didn't mention the word radical at all. So I think he'd sort of been tamed by the realities of, of, of governing Gauteng. And uh, he didn't complete his full term, two terms of office uh, either. Uh, that's when uh, Paul Mashatil, uh, that's when, sorry, Le Sufi, uh, that's when Panyaza Le Sufi came in. But but to get back to what Gauteng was like in, in 1994, um, the province, the, the provincial population was, was much smaller, uh, about half of what it is now. So obviously there's been a massive population growth. A lot of it's in migration from, from other provinces. Uh, province, uh, I was just looking at the budget in 94. 1995, the budget was just under 11 billion rand. That was the entire budget of, of Gauteng. The entire budget of Gauteng now is just under 166 billion rand. So I, I did the, the inflation calculation, and uh, it's been a, a really big jump in the budget, uh, about uh, even on a per capita basis. Obviously, there's effective inflation. Uh, the population has more than doubled, but on a per capita basis, it's still one and a half times what it was in 1994. So, you know, that some things were done right, uh, you know, in terms of uh, growing the economy, but that was mostly during the, the early years, uh, the Mandela years, the Tar Becky years, and then I think we went into reverse with Jacob Zuma. And, of course, um, Gauteng was affected by the national trends. So, so we actually have an enormous budget uh, with a lot more to spend per capita, even accounting for all the uh, population growth. And what are we doing with it? I, I just think there's just been so much corruption, wastage, maladministration. Um, even under Mbazima Shaloa, you can look quite critically at the at the Khao train, which was called the Shaloa Express. Well, I remember when they started mooting it, it was going to cost four to five billion rand. Then the the figures kept going up, 10 billion, 12 billion, 20 million, it cost closer to 30 billion rand. And the story then was about a quarter of that went to, to the ANC and the South African Communist Party. And uh, it's not the, the, you know, meanwhile, this was a, uh, you can argue the pros and cons of it, but we spent uh, more than billion rand, 30 billion rand. And, and to this day, between one and two billion rand every year to subsidize it. And the crying need, uh, for the population for Gauteng has just been uh, ordinary rail. Uh, you know, I don't see why we didn't get Praza correct, Praza and Transnet uh, uh, to the extent now, and of course that's a, a national issue, um, ordinary people can't go by train anymore. So meanwhile, we were squandering money on the Gau train, which the middle class uh, adore and love. But what about the ordinary people and all the money that we still shelled out uh, you know, close to two billion a rand uh, a year subsidizing the, the Gau train. So, I, I mean, I, I would say there's some poor decisions made, but uh, um, it's, um, you know, when I, when I think back to it, um, the what we have now with uh, Panyaza, the Sufi, to me is uh, peak ANC is what I call it. Uh, each ANC premier can only get worse. They might start off speaking about radical changes and spirit of renewal, and they're going to do big things. Uh, in fact, but the mechanisms to do it gets worse and worse because when you've got aided deployment, cronyism, corruption, I call them the three C's, over many, many years, uh, your civil service is just completely uh, uh, neutered. You, you haven't got the instrument to do what needs to be done. And, and the more that good, competent people are pushed out or leave or retire, you've got less to play with. So with Panyaza, Le Sufi, we also have to consider to what degree is he a hostage, if you could use that term of his own executive. That's always been a problem with the ANC. Uh, he didn't uh, outright when he became chairperson of the ANC. That's the seat of power. But he didn't. Uh, his executive committee seems to be controlled by Lebechang Mayile and uh, Paul Machatile, of course, is in the is in the background of it, um, and 
when we come to the possibility of a provincial unity government, well, it didn't happen. Uh, it happened at the national level. It happened at KZN. And Gauteng, it just didn't seem to fly. And I think the reason that it, it didn't fly was, um, it's as I said, it's debatable how much uh, the Sufi really wants it or has the power to, to do it. Um, I certainly see that Leber van Meijle and the Alex Mafia and Paul Machatele behind the scenes uh, didn't want it for their own reasons. Uh, two things mainly. I, I think the one was, uh, they did, well, first of all, they didn't want to say share power. Absolutely have not come to terms with the fact that uh, they're actually a 35% party in Gauteng and they, they cannot come to grips with that. Uh, but secondly, I think they're just plain scared. What would happen if the DA got hold of any sort of substantial portfolio and uncovered the massive corruption and malice with going on there? Because it's a, it's a thoroughly rotten uh, provincial government. Uh, I can't think of any portfolio where there hasn't been a, a massive scandal of some kind or another. And who knows what reports a, a DA MEC would find when he or she takes office. So I think that was the big risk that they were worried about. And then we heard reports that uh, in the media that, oh, they were worried the DA would outperform the, the ANC in their portfolio. It's not difficult to do, I have to say. Um, but they were worried uh, that we would outperform them and it would help us in the local government uh, elections coming up. But one of the other reasons actually was that I think there must be a COVID deal with the EFF. Uh, obviously, they're in alliance of some kind. It seems to have uh, some troubles at the moment. But in both the Kuruleni and Johannesburg, they rely on the EFF to to, to keep power. And um, they are a minority provincial government. They will have to survive uh, budget votes. So I did see the leader of the EFF in Gauteng saying they would uh, support budget votes for, for the ANC because they don't want to bring the, the, the DA into power. So I don't know how long that would last. Uh, the whole point of a... Of a of a GNU in such a situation is that you you don't have motions, no confidence uh, every few months that you could lose. You don't have budget votes that you can use. You have stability, and we, we're certainly not going to have it. So uh, as a minority provincial government, uh, maybe they can stumble ahead for a couple of months, maybe even years, but this is not the sort of uh, renewal that we, we could have had. I think, uh, uh, I, I think that the... You know the, the, the strong force within the ANC, all the factions they have to please, the frankly corrupt people that they that they protect. Let's see what the so-called provincial uh, government of unity is. I, I don't even know how they could even use that term. What they did is they gave three positions away: one to the IFP e government, they took it off from another portfolio, and the IFP got less than one percent of the vote. Then Rise and Zanzi also got less than one percent of the vote. I don't know why they had to be included. They got uh, uh, the agriculture uh, portfolio, but that was split. The environment part of that was split to to give to uh, the Patriotic, Patriotic Alliance, which actually has two seats as opposed to the one seat of the IFP and and Rizem Zanzi. Uh, imagine taking the smallest portfolio in a highly urbanized province. So you're taking the agriculture portfolio, you split it, and then you give a, a small por portion of it uh, uh, to to uh, to the Patriotic Alliance. So we worked it out that um, uh, they actually gave away the absolute minimum, 2% of the budget. That's all they did. So a party with 35% of the votes still controls 98% uh, of the budget. And that tells you why they didn't want to share power with the DA. They didn't want to give us any substantial uh, portfolio that we could exercise real influence and it and i think the the sheer bad faith of the of, of the thing is that they never came forward to us uh, they peremptorily said that uh, uh, we'll give you three port f portfolios three three positions in terms of proportionality which they should have accepted uh, there's only you know seven and a half percent uh separating the DA and the ANC in, in Gauteng. We've got 22 seats out of 80. They've got uh, 28 seats out of 80. So um, the fact that they got the premiership, they've got the speak of the Gauteng legislature, and then they want to give us a mere three out of 10 seats, 
and they won't even tell us what they are. And we certainly would not have accepted minor portfolios. So it was a non-starter. And I, I think it just shows you that in South Africa's richest province, most industrialized province, you know, we contribute uh, more than a third to the gross national product. The same old gang is in control. Um, Alex Mafia, everything that uh, that caused the ANC to lose votes in a mass way, and they don't seem to have learned the lessons. So that's the impasse that we, we're at now. And it's, it's such a pity when I think back to it, um, is that the budget is there in many cases, just so badly spent. And uh, even a sort of moderately competent uh, provincial government, or I would say even a moderately in, incompetent, moderately incompetent uh, government, we, we could have done so much better in the sense that there's been Outright scandals, mass wastage, scouting health department is just a cesspit of corruption still. Um, as we all know, people get assassinated in this province because they, they, they are uncovering corruption. And uh, here we have an, an arrogant party in power. They still haven't come to, the terms with, come to terms with the fact that they're a minority party, 35%. So they've added... Uh, the bits and pieces of, of small other parties doesn't bring them much. Uh, and come uh, budget time, they're going to have to do some serious negotiations or lose the budgets or lose votes, motions of no confidence. And then uh, we have to come to a more sustainable uh, arrangement in the interests of this province. I think uh, what they're doing now is simply not what the voters wanted. The voters actually were sending a massive signal to the ANC in this province that they wanted uh, a different uh, scheme of governance, and that's not what they're getting. Jack, how would you compare Democratic Alliance rule in the Western Cape to ANC rule in Gauteng? Well, I mean, the when the DA took over in Western Cape, uh, it wasn't as ruined by the ANC as it, as as is the case in, in the Gauteng. Uh, they hadn't had that long a period of rule. There was still... Uh, a civil service that that could function, and I think it's just a, a massive contrast. Firstly, uh, Helen Zilla, I think a very successful premier, and uh, she served a full two terms, which no ANC premier has managed to do in Khao Teng. And the most amazing statistic is that uh, there's more construction happening in in the Western Cape, or in Cape Town alone, Cape Town alone, than the whole of Khao Teng. How can that be? I mean, Gauteng is by far the, the largest economic actor, much larger population, and yet uh, there's uh, way more construction activity going on in the Western Cape. And then if you look at jobs created, uh, Western Cape has been way more successful than Gauteng. Gauteng's been losing jobs. It's just chalk and cheese. Uh, and this is the sort of governance that Gauteng could have had uh, if, if we'd gone the provincial unity, government of provincial unity. Uh, I think the DA MECs, if they had decent portfolios, could have similarly performed to their counterparts at Western Cape. In fact, we had a very serious ready-to-govern program. We, it was a serious prospect of us taking uh, power in some form, maybe as a minority of government of our own. Uh, can't all foresee the future that, uh, that there's a government of national unity uh, but that's how it's panned out. And, and the, the bad faith, because this government of national unity should surely have percolated to the provinces. It was meant to to to, to bind the, the provinces. But uh, we had a, an agreement with our counterparts of the Western Cape uh, to make us a sister province and uh, that they would uh, deploy or uh, in some way give us of their expertise. And we would have done wonderful things in particular departments uh, using uh, the lessons learned in, in the Western Cape. Uh, unfortunately, that's not going to happen now. Um, it's it's just very unfortunate. Uh, I think the next, uh, assuming that uh, Premier Le Sufi can survive budget votes, because that's the big test for him, really. And uh, I can tell you now, if there's another scandal the size of life has said to me any or any of the other scandals we've had, there's emotional no confidence. He'd be hard put to survive it. So then we, we might get a, a, a real change. But we've got local government elections coming up. And, uh, well, everybody who lives in Joburg knows that uh, the city's falling apart. Um, Kuruleni is, is also in bad shape. Uh, um, 
you know, we, we're doing the best we can. We're turning around. I think Mayor Silias Brink is doing extremely good work in, in Chwani, but that's the pity of it all. One of the portfolios that we did ask for in Gauteng was uh, cooperative government, you know, the local government portfolio. And I think we could have done some great things there. You can see that the national minister of, of local government, who is an IFP minister, is talking about uh, how can we allow these dis dysfunctional municipalities continue. Uh, we've got unbelievably dysfunctional personal, uh, municipalities, not just the metros, uh, but M. Fileni is just terrible. Merifrol, I don't know how this co could continue. Um, and uh, you, the, the provincial government should be stepping in in a constructive manner uh, can I just say, you know, uh, you know how to, st you know, the first principle of medicine is do no harm. <laughs> so if you can't do any good, do no harm. Um, one of the very bad things of Premier David Makura is he put uh, the city of Chwani under administration and put an administrator there. And at the time, that city had a budget surplus. And by the time uh, that was overruled by the court, I mean, here was the Premier of the province prompted by Lebethang the Yellow, as I recall it, doing an illegal action. We had to go to court to reverse it. But the damage of that illegal action, putting Chwani under administration, purely because it was run by the DA. I mean, a bold political act, shameless, actually. Uh, and, and, and when we took over again, I mean, we suddenly had these massive budget deficits, and that's the problem. So, I mean, if we just had a provincial government that would start by doing no harm, uh, instead of, uh, you know, now we have a reckless proposal for a state bank. You know, they want to have a state bank. This is because they want to loot more, um, you know, or what. For, a, for a, a provincial government that has such poor capacity to suddenly think they can run a, a state bank, just, uh, it's just big as the imagination. Um, uh, and here they are just, you know, telling us that they go full steam ahead, learned nothing from the from the election, and we'll have to see what uh, the, for the future brings us, whether this is a stable administration or not. I was just going to ask you, Jack, what words of encouragement or not do you have for people who are relying on Gauteng municipalities to start delivering the services they need? Well, the, there are going to be municipal elections uh, not too far ahead, and I think uh, people must ensure they're registered, people must pitch up to vote, turnouts are, are very important. There's been a, a very concerning slide in, in, in voter turnout, which uh, which shows you that people are, are un, you know, comfortable, but they should need to turn out and vote for an opposition party, quite frankly. Uh, as we talk to you now, uh, our particular household has no water. You know, at least we have electricity, but who knows for how long. Uh, you know, major metros without water, basic conveniences. Um, uh, elections are the vehicle of change. Unfortunately, in Gauteng, uh, where the ANC is only a 35% party now, having been, uh, you know, when we started off in 94, they had a solid, solid majority, and uh, they have not come to terms with it. So the voters, I think, need to give them another reminder about it. It's a pity that... Uh, we might have to wait for, for the local government elections. But I can tell you now, if uh, the ANC record of scandal continues, uh, I don't think the Sufi is going to survive a emotional low confidence. And uh, the good news, uh, the DA will be fully engaged with, uh, with challenging uh, this provincial government, uh, as we always have. Uh, we have uh, a large team. We have 22 out of 80 uh, 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 legislators, and uh, we will. Uh, we've got a game plan. We we will expose the corruption that we see, and there's a lot of opportunities there because the ANC doesn't have a majority on those committees, uh, so we can put motions that they might not carry. Um, in the old days, uh, in the previous legislature, we would put a motion in the House, and the ANC votes it down. Now we could put a, a motion in the House and. If they lose. They lose budgets. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities here, and it's for us to exploit them, and we will use the committee system. We'll use the committee system to demand documents and reports and accountability. Um, I mean, we have a situation now in the Gauteng Health Department where you think they would have learned from 
life has set in any, and we've now had a, a landmark uh, uh, inquest judgment, actually, that holds a politician to account. Imagine that uh, Kodani Mishlangu uh, is going to, in, in all likelihood, be charged with culpable homicide based on results of the um, of the inquest. Uh, an MEC politician is going to be criminally charged. I think that's a real step forward for, for our democracy. Uh, but then what does the provincial government learn from this? Uh, we saw the social development uh, department this year withholding subsidies for their own peculiar reasons. Uh, Premier Le Sufi had to apologize. And, you know, it was never nearly another life has said many because uh, uh, these NGOs, these are the good NGOs, not the bad NGOs. These are good NGOs trying to do the best for for vulnerable people and uh, they weren't getting their subsidies. It's just an absolute scandal that this could continue. So look, we are democracy and we are at least going to get uh, finally, and uh, the DA is pushing to, to expedite the, 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 the charges, uh, 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 a whole ANC MEC uh, being criminally charged. I hope that's a very strong signal uh, that uh, negligence uh, that costs lives um, uh, should be avoided, not only because it's it's morally wrong, but because, uh, frankly, the law is going to catch up with you. So I think there's many factors in play. We we can't uh, foresee the future. We we do have a spirit of optimism in the, in the country because of the government of national unity. It's just a dire pity that it hasn't covered Gauteng, but uh, the DA will do what we can to change things around. Uh, if we have to wait for the next election for the voters to send a stronger signal, that's fine. But uh, we will be the opposition that we always have been with lots of opportunities to change uh, to change uh, policies, even from the opposition benches, because ultimately the ANC does not have a majority in the Gauteng Provincial Legislature. Thank you. That was Veteran Democratic Alliance politician Mr. Jack Bloom speaking to Biz News about 30 years of African National Congress rule in Gauteng and giving details of a Democratic Alliance's game plan to hold the minority ANC government accountable. Thank you, Mr. Bloom. I'm Chris Stane.